So I make this as a confession that I will meditate therein both day and night on a chapter in the morning and a chapter in the evening. And because I do, my life is blessed. It's no more a mess. Now everything I touch, come on, everything I touch now turns to success. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. Amen. Put your hands together for everybody joining us on Facebook. Hello. Thank you for being a part of our Faith Family Church broadcast. We're getting ready to go before God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this, another opportunity to meditate in your word. Your word, oh God, is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path. We ask that you shine the light of your word to us today by the Holy Spirit. Help us to see clearly your message to each and every one of us individually. Let not one of us leave untouched by the power of your word. Let all of us be changed in Jesus' name. And all agree with that prayer said, amen. amen. God bless you. I want to talk to you about the story of amazing love. So if you would, turn with me in your Bible to the book of Matthew chapter 1. We're just going to simply look at verse 18 through 25 today. In verse 18, the Bible says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. In this short period of time that I'll have to minister to you this morning, I want us to look at the birth of Jesus Christ. This is indeed what this season and this time of celebration is all about. I'm thoroughly convinced that the world has made it out to be something that it's not intended to be. Although Christmas is a great time for family to come together, it's not about family coming together. It is about the birth of Jesus Christ. It's not about gift giving. It's about the greatest gift ever given. Amen. For God so loved each and every one of us that he gave the greatest gift, his only begotten son. And that's really what this season is about. It's about the birth of Jesus Christ. Well, you know, when you think about that, it is the story of amazing love. It's about this story about the birth of Christ is not just about the baby in a manger. It's really about the lead character who is God, who loved us so much that he didn't leave us in a bad situation. How many of you all know what Adam did in the garden left us in a bad situation? Amen. And, and so God had a plan, even though Adam did something that opened up the door for bad things to happen. You know, every every bad thing that's happened to you or a loved one in life is and was a result of Adam's sin in the garden. The Bible says that because of one man's sin, death entered into the world. Death passed upon all men for all have sinned. That one act of disobedience opened up the door for those things to happen. But the story is the story of amazing love. God didn't leave us, and that's what love does. Love will never leave you in a bad situation, and God is love. Jesus himself gave up all of the beauty of heaven, the splendors and majesty of being with God the Father, and was born in flesh. He was at the beginning, but was made flesh and dwelt among us. He is the savior of the world. He came to save us from all of our sins. You know, the Bible talks about the greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. That could be no more true in its greatness than when Jesus laid his life down on the cross. He said, no man takes my life, 
but I lay it down. Come on. That I might pick it back up again. Because of the amazing love of Jesus, we have eternal life. Jesus himself said, he said, I came that you might have life and enjoy it. Come on. That you can have life to the full till it overflows so that you can have an abundant life. He said, I came so that you could live a good life. Thank God. And that is the story of amazing love. But there are other characters in this story. The Bible says here the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows after his mother Mary. If we were to take the time to look at this story, I mean, God came to her and said, hey, I want to use you to be the mother of the Messiah. At the end of that story, ultimately, because of her love for God, that would be very strange. An angel appearing, saying, hey, I want to use you to do this great thing, and and I want to do this. But, you know, at the end of that story, she said, be it unto me according to your word. She was willing to put her life on the line, as it were, for us. But there's another character in this story, and I really want to focus on Joseph today. And I want you to identify, if you can, with Joseph. As I've been taught, one of the greatest things that you can do when you read the Bible, as we'll be reading our chapters this week, um, one of the greatest things that you can do is go there. Imagine yourself in this moment. Imagine a man seeing a man who's betrothed to a wife. Now, we, we, we don't use that word betrothed often, or if at all. I've never texted anybody and said, hey, so-and-so is betrothed to somebody else. (laughs) At best, we'll use the word engaged. I guess in the Jewish culture, there was an even stronger meaning when you're betrothed to someone. From what I understand, it's as if you were married. Not yet fully, but, I mean, as if you were. The Bible says that Joseph was betrothed to, to Mary. And it says before they came together. Now, um, well, the children are in children's church. (laughs) So before they knew each other sexually, this situation happened. That means they were engaged and hadn't been to the holy place. (laughs) So before they came together, they're, they're, they're in this committed relationship. They don't know each other. In a, in a sexually intimate way, and all of a sudden, the Bible says that she was found with a child. Now, I know it says found with the child of the Holy Spirit, but as far as Joseph is concerned, you all have to imagine being in his shoes. Think about it. You're dating somebody. Matter of fact, not just dating, but you are engaged to this girl, and all of a sudden, you know, every now and then, you know, well, what's wrong? Well, I'm not feeling well. A little morning sickness. You know, she doesn't say that. But she just, <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what, what's going on, Mary? No, I, I, I don't want to go to breakfast this morning. I'm just not, not feeling myself. The Bible says that she was found with the child. She didn't say, hey, you know, I'm pregnant with Jesus. <laughs> now, we read the story because we know the end. You know, from the beginning of the story, but put yourself in Joseph's position, walk in his shoes for a moment. Maybe all of a sudden she's starting to show. And he finds out, you know, like, well, what's going on, babe? You're putting on some weight. (laughs) And she says, I'm pregnant. Can you imagine that moment? You're engaged to somebody and find out you hadn't been with her in that kind of way. But all of a sudden, you find out that she's with somebody else that kind of way. (laughs) Notice the next verse in Matthew chapter 1, verse 19. The Bible says, then Joseph, her husband, calls her husband. I mean, betrothed was a pretty big deal. Being a just man, so he was a man of integrity, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. So he finds out that she's pregnant and his um, probably was some very devastating news. Not what he had expected in this relationship, not what he had planned. And he's thinking, you know what? I'm not going to put you on blast. I'm not going to put you on Facebook. (laughs) 
We're not going on the Maury Povich show. <laughs> you know, I grew up and you know, I, I mean, I'm sure you've heard this as I have, you know, like what goes on in this house stays in this house. And there's a great, great bit of integrity that comes with that. Joseph was such a man of integrity that even though he's finding out some what could be extremely negative and impactful news, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm a man of integrity and I'm not, will, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not wanting to make you a public example. How many of y'all know other people in this kind of situation in the Bible were made a public example? Matter of fact, in the book of Moses, God t instructed them, if you have somebody that's engaged and they're sleeping around, you need to bring it. Matter of fact, stone them so everybody knows not to go in this direction. Come on. Oh, y'all quiet in this church. Matter of fact, as a matter of fact, they, they brought a woman who was caught in adultery. I mean, if, if she's known as her husband or husband to be, this is an adulterous, you know, potentially adulterous situation. They bring one woman probably barely clothed, caught in the act, m meaning to bring her to stoning. But Joseph, he's like, you know what? I, I'm not going to do all of that. To me, this is the story of an amazing love. I see an amazing love in Joseph that's very uncommon. Think about it, not wanting to make her a public example he was minded to put her away privately. This brings to mind a verse of scripture in 1 Peter chapter 4. So if you can go there with me. In 1 Peter chapter 4, I want to look at verse 8, but I was just kind of led to go back and look at verse 7. The Bible says in verse 7, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Can I take a little side note for a moment to encourage you? to be serious and to be watchful in prayer. We shared testimonies of people who called in for prayer. You know, Jesus said in, in, that, that you've made my, my house something other than it should be. My house shall be called a house of prayer. How many of y'all know when you're going through something that's bigger than you are, you ought to be able to call upon God for help? Amen. Amen. And, and, and the church is that place the Bible says, is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them come and pray for them. Let the elders pray for them and that the, the Lord would raise them up. Prayer is so important. But notice this verse of scripture says that the end of all things is at hand. Think about that. He wrote that or said, no, he wrote that nearly 2000 years ago. Peter's perspective was the end of all things is coming is coming soon. How many have ever watched a movie and there's somebody on the street corner, maybe a preacher, or maybe a homeless person, and, and in the movie they're holding up a sign, the end of the world is near. Okay, y'all haven't seen that kind of movie. <laughs> I've seen that. I've seen it in real life. I've seen it on the television. And I'm here to hold up a sign today. I know we're just at the end of a year, but I'm here to tell you by the Holy Spirit, the end of all things is at hand. And as a result, there's two things, matter of fact, three things that we need to do. Number one, we need to be serious. You know, take your spiritual life seriously. Don't allow opportunities like right division or 21 days of fasting and prayer to get by you. Be serious. Somebody say be serious. Number two in this verse, he says, be watchful in your prayers. How many of y'all know you should pray every day and more than just for your food? Come on, if that's the only prayer that you pray every day, then, you know, you need to be more serious. <laughs> right? So, be, so number one is be serious. Number two, be watchful in prayer. But then number three in verse 80 says, and above all things, have fervent love for one another. Why? For love will cover a multitude of sins. The third thing that we need to do is have fervent love. We just finished a series about perfecting love. And in that, we learned that we are commanded to love one another in life and in relationship like God loves us. Put that in Joseph's story. I believe he has a fervent love for Mary. Why? Because he's not going to put her on the shame show. Here I am. I'm engaged to you and you're sleeping with somebody else. You don't know how that makes me feel. 
I want to be with you. My body wants to be with you, but I'm keeping myself because we want to do this God's way. And then here come to find out you've been, you know, uh, come on, y'all. <laughs> 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 you, 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 you've been doing other things, you know. I mean, that, that could break that could break your heart. Right. But he's got a fervent love and love will never leave you in a bad situation. What does love do? The Bible says love covers, not exposes. Come on, man. It covers a multitude of sins. Now, for Joseph, I mean, he doesn't know that Mary hasn't sinned, but what it looks like. So even when, when it looks like things are going on, love still covers. This isn't a story of an amazing love. So let's go back. In, in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20, so while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, and he said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife. Notice he calls her your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Notice he's thinking about putting her away privately. Love is covering a multitude of sins. While he thought about that, an angel appears to him. And you might be in a relationship right now, whether it be a marriage or a friendship. Maybe it's a family member. And they did something that, that's causing you to think, you know what? I don't want to have no more dealings with you. I'm done. You've hurt me. If that's you, I want you to see amazing love demonstrated in this story. I want you to put yourself in this place. The Bible says, first of all, God sent an angel. And he says, tell him. Don't be afraid. And maybe you're in a marriage and something really, really bad happened, or maybe you're in a relation. I don't know what it is, but I, I'm just led to tell you, don't be afraid. This is the first thing. We, you know, recently we just finished a series about fear not and believe only. God's got a plan. This is not the end of that. So he says, do not be afraid. And then he tells him why, gives him a reason why he doesn't have to be afraid. It says, for this child is, is from the Holy Spirit. Ah, man, that's still a stretch. I mean, I've never heard of anything like that if I was Joseph, right? But here, let me help you. The Holy Spirit led me to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 12 through, I think, about verse 16 to minister because maybe there's someone here in a marriage and you're thinking about calling it quits, putting away his divorce. Maybe something happened. Maybe they're not treating you the way that you feel you should be treated. Maybe you're just not happy. Listen to what the word of God says about this. He says, but to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if a brother has a wife who, do, who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. That's interesting. Verse 13 says, and a woman who has a husband who does not believe if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. The word put away in scripture is equivalent to divorce. Because of what happened, Joseph is thinking, I'm going to divorce her. This thing hurt me so bad, I am going to let her go. Here's the admonition to you. Maybe you're in a relationship, you got saved, and since you got saved, your spouse is still an unbeliever. Guess what? An unbelieving husband and an unbelieving wife are going to do unbelieving things. They're going to act like an unbeliever. Well, how does an unbeliever act? They lie, they steal, they cheat, they, they cuss, they smoke, they drink. I'm talking about the unbeliever. But, the, but, but look at this. He says, if you're married, if a believer, if a Christian woman or a Christian man is married to somebody who's Who's, who's not acting like God, who, who's an unbeliever, who's doing what unbelieving people do, what should they do? He says, well, if that unbelieving person is willing to stay with them and be married to them, then stay with them and be married to them. You would think, well, why? But he gives the answer. He says in verse 14, four. Now, remember, he told Joseph, don't be afraid, and then gave him a reason why. Let me give you a reason why. He says to the unbelieving, to the person married to the unbelieving, he says, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. 
And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. If you're here and you've been in a relationship, it doesn't have to just be a marriage. Maybe it's a family relationship and you're minded to just be done with that. Let me encourage you. Number one, be not afraid. Yeah, it's bad. It, it, It shouldn't have happened, but don't be afraid. You have no reason to fear. God is on your side. Amen. And that makes you a majority. Number two, he says, he gives you a reason why. One of the reasons why, in this case, a a, a husband and wife should stay together is because the children would be unclean or the, the children would be negatively impacted in one way or another. And so as an act of agape, who is getting quiet now? Y'all starting to make me sweat. He said the children would be unclean, elsewise they would be holy. It keeps going. When you look at verse 15, it says, but if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. Let that old sorry rascal go. No, no, I'm just reading the Bible. (laughs) And and a brother and a sister, a Christian woman or man, is not bound in such cases, but God has called us to peace. In other words, the heart is still to reach the unbeliever. The heart of God is still to reach the unbeliever. He gives you another reason why you should think twice before you depart. He says, for how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? He says, your decision has an impact on the outcome of this other person's life, these other children, the the impact on their lives, And so he gives you reasons why you should have a fervent, amazing, uncommon love. Amen? Amen. Okay. Thank you, Lord. All right. Y'all making me sweat, so. All right. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. Let's get back into this story. He said, how do you know you're not going to save them? Well, isn't it interesting that in this story, salvation is also present? He said, while he thought on these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you, marry your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their what sins. He says, do not be afraid for he will save his people from his sins. Notice that the reason for him to not be afraid has to do with salvation from sins. Come on. And that's what happens when we learn to love individuals in our lives with an amazing love, which is the God kind of love. I'm not talking about eros, sexual love. I'm not talking about storge, a motherly love or a family-like love or even a brotherly love. I'm talking about this agape, unconditional love. Like they cannot do anything to make you love them any less. Am I preaching good to somebody? He says there's a reason why that you can have this kind of an amazing love. It has an impact on the outcome of other people's lives. And so Joseph, um, while he thought about that, he said, she'll bring, okay, thank you. In verse 22, so all of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. In Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 is where the prophet prophesied for unto us that a virgin would have a baby. In in Isaiah 9, he says, for unto us a a child is born. And we we just heard that song while the, the, the dancers dance. But in Isaiah 7 and 14, he says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. What I see in this story for Joseph's sake is that he was telling him, do not be afraid for God has a plan. 
whatever it is that you're in right now, in a relationship or in life, and things look very difficult, maybe you're thinking about going in a different direction, I'm encouraging you, stick with it, stay with it. Why? Because God's got a plan. He wasn't surprised when you found out what you found out. He knew the end from the beginning. And he's already has a plan for you to have a good future. So even though your mind not, may not be able to comprehend what's happening and what you're going through, don't be afraid. Why? Because God's got a plan. And I can tell you, his plan for you is bright. Come on. His plan for you is blessing in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, in verse 24, then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife. Do you all think he made the right decision? Come on. But at this moment, I mean, it could be that, yeah, he just had some pizza and he just had a weird dream. Come on. She's still pregnant, about to have somebody else's baby. Come on. That he's going to have to raise for at least 18 years. <laughs> He's going to have to feed him. He's going to have to clothe him. And all the while, he knows that that's not my son. Oh, man, I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. How many of y'all know that's an amazing love when you can love someone else's child as if it were your own? Thank God for all the moms and dads in the world. But especially thank God for all the adopted moms and all the adopted dads in the world. Come on. Thank God for all the foster moms and the foster dads, the, the God moms and the God dads. What am I saying? That is an amazing love. This is not my biological child, but I'm going to love him as if he were my own. If they were to do me wrong, I'm going to always be right by them. That's the picture of an amazing love. So Joseph, being aroused from the sleep, he did as the angel commanded him. And that's what I want to encourage you. If you're married, do as the Lord has commanded you. That means don't get divorced. He said in 1 Corinthians 7, we'll read it when we read the whole chapter. He said, to the married I speak, let them not depart. Come on, somebody. And even the exhortation, if you're married to someone that's not saved, he says, stay with it, stick with it. God's got a plan. Come on. And in that plan is the salvation of that other person and, it, and its impact on those children's lives. And we see it here that he got up and he did as he was commanded to do. Verse 25, he did as he was commanded to do and he did not know her Till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and she called his, and he called his name Jesus. Oh, come on, somebody. So not only did he do it as he was commanded, and he did not know her till she had brought forth her son. Now, when the Bible says that Adam knew his wife, it's not like, hey, you know, come here, babe, come here for a moment. You're just so cute. I just got to show you off to the world. Now, this beautiful woman is my wife. Amen. She's so cute. Oh, just come here, girl. <laughs> um, so it's like, hey, my name is Stanley. <laughs> What's your name? Mark oh, nice to know you. Nice to get to meet you. Amen. <laughs> so now the Bible says that, that he, not only did he do as, as God commanded him, he also didn't have sexual relations with her until after the baby was born. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm preaching good. Amen. Thank you very much. We're going to call you Von, uh, Vanna Black. Amen. <laughs> she's all dressed. No, not because she's African American. She has all black on today. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> ah, 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 ah. <laughs> all right, let me get back on track. I'm almost done because verse 25 is like the last part of the story, and then we go to chapter 2, and we'll get that on Tuesday night. But notice that he did not know her. I, I ministered to um, married people in a moment. And before I close the, the service, I want to minister to you if you're unmarried. So you can say, well, okay, well, Pastor, you know, that part of the message really doesn't apply to me because I'm not yet married. 
but you still do have a command from the Lord. You see, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 18 to flee fornication. I mean, think about it. He did not have sexual relations with her. See, from what I remember, yeah, I remember because we got two kids. <laughs> you can have sexual relations after she's pregnant. So, I mean, his disposition, and it has no impact negatively on the baby. I'm preaching good. So he could have been like, well, hey, the, you know, the thing is done. And, you know, like people in this world, you know, it, try, try it. What do they say? Try it to try it. I better try it before I drive it. Oh, it's quiet in this church. Oh, I just can't imagine marrying somebody without having sexual relations with them first, right? That's what the Bible says to do. See, when the Bible says to flee for, who thought? Who would have thought that we would have been talking about sex the days before Christmas? I thought this was a Christmas morning message. It is. The Bible says he did not have sex with her until after she had the baby. What is that? That is absolute integrity. And that's what we should have or you should have as a married person, integrity, and an unmarried person, integrity. If you remember from our series on perfecting love, we talked about sex. The reason why God ordained marriage was to give you the opportunity to love a person at the highest level humanly possible. That is the purpose of sexual intimacy. It's not about procreation, yet it is about procreation. That's not the sum total of it. It's not about pleasure, though it is about pleasure. That's not the sum total of it. What God had, I'm preaching whether y'all are like this or not. What God had in mind when he put all of those nerve endings in your body. Come on. Oh, I'm preaching good now. What God had in mind when he gave you one of the strongest drives in the human anatomy, it'll drive you crazy. Come on. <laughs> what was God thinking? <laughs> oh, I know what he was thinking. I've got the revelation of it. See, I love you with agape. And it's the same kind of love that I love my wife Marquita with. I love her with agape. That means the love I have for you is the equal, it's the equal of the love that I have for her. This is fascinating. But what's the difference? The expression of it. Right? I can say to you, I love you. I can say to her, I love her, I love her. And there's no difference because I agape you and I agape her. But there is a difference. Because with her, I can express love to her on a level that I can't with any other human being. It would be a violation of covenant for me to express that kind of love to somebody else. Man, I'm preaching good. So this will help you as an unmarried person to keep yourself when you understand what God was thinking. Amen. He says, flee fornication. Somebody say, what is fornication? You know, there was a teenager messing with me when I was in high school because I was raised to not have sex until after marriage. So I was well into my adult years before I had sexual in intimacy with a woman. Oh, it's quiet. Pin drop. <laughs> <laughs> right. I was going through high school while they were talking about this and that. I was like, flee fornication. I said out loud, matter of fact, they mocked me, and when Kevin came into the locker room, he was like, yes, yeah, Stan, free fornication. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, this is good. So what is fornication? Well, if you don't know, the New King James breaks it down, and it says flee sexual immorality. Let's think about this for a moment, since we're already uncomfortable. <laughs> What could make sexual relations immoral? Think about that for a moment, because he says stay away from it. So you need to know what that is. Well, what would make sexual relations immoral? Well, number one, incest is immoral, right? Yeah. A parent having intimacy with, okay, what else? Uh, molestation, that's just like evil, right? Yeah. That is immoral, okay. Rape, forcing somebody, you know, in a nursing home, you know, the, the real, come on somebody, that's just, that's just wrong. 
And there are many other kinds of things that are that, that make that that immoral. Um, but, you know, two consenting adults. I mean, one guy said, if loving you is wrong. Then the guy said, I'm talking about the guy on the song. He said, if loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. <laughs> and and in, and in a marriage, if you've ever done it, you think, man, this is amazing, right? Well, what, what, what could make two consenting adults, what could make that? She's okay with it. He's okay with it. What, what could make that immoral? Because God is saying, stay away from it. What could make it immoral? Because of the design for you to express yourself to your spouse at the highest level, you shouldn't share that with anybody else. Essentially, that could be somebody else's wife. Essentially, that could be somebody else's husband. We know adultery is immoral, right? So you you don't want to share that. And so as a result, you want to stay away from that. And what that means for, for you, then, if you're unmarried, is to keep yourself chaste. Another reason why it makes it immoral, the Bible says here, you sin against your own body. In other words, and I always wondered that from the time I, listen, I, I've studied this thoroughly, right? From the time I was a young man, I was like, why God? I remember, can I tell y'all another story? Mom and dad, they always watch Facebook, so they'll enjoy this, and I'm sure they'll remember. We were at 469 East Grand Boulevard in Detroit, Michigan, 48207. Come on, somebody, I remember this. I was in my teenage years. I was standing. I can vividly see my, my mom. She's kind of preparing dinner in the kitchen. And I'm standing there and I'm telling her, like, Mom, I want to have sex. Everybody's having sex. I want to have sex, too. Why can't I have sex? My questions were like, like, like a machine gun, right? Mom, I want to have sex. The other kids are having sex. Did you and Dad have sex before y'all got married? <laughs> Woo! Man, I want to have sex. As soon as my dad came home, she looked at him, Stanley, talk to your son, right? And, well, what? What, what is it? And I, I said, you know, well, Dad, I want to have sex. And I remember he told me, he says, no, there's a special blessing that comes when you wait. Amen. I may not have understood it now then, but I really, understand, I really understand it now. There's a blessing when you wait. The Bible says that when you commit fornication or sexual morality, do something like you sin against your own body. One of the one of the things that you do with your body is you end up programming your body to that other body. Y'all gonna let me finish? I'm already out here, right? The reason why he says, and if you've ever been in a relationship and then you broke it up and you got like this this thing that, come on, that's just y'all help me. Thank you. And you wonder why, you know, why? Listen, in the animal kingdom, they don't have none of that. Come on. They could be here today and there tomorrow, right? No love lost, right? But you snotting and crying and oh. Why? There was some internal programming just in the early part of 1 Corinthians 6. He says when you have relations with a harlot he used, or someone other than the person you're married to, you become one with them, right? I'm just pointing out the integrity. Do as you're commanded to do. He said flee fornication. I'm not, now, the Bible says there's no condemnation, but when you get into the point of premeditation, there ought to be condemnation. <laughs> if you've messed up and I've already been to that holy place, amen, Repent and head in the right direction. Amen. And then you'll get to find out, does that person want you? Uh, oh, my pastor said that, that fornication is a sin, so, you know, we, we can't do this no more. <laughs> you about to find out whether this was some amazing love. <laughs> hey, man, did y'all get anything out of this message today? Amen. Stand up on you. <laughs> oh, thank you all, Facebook, for joining. Come on back next week. Hopefully it didn't make you blush or turn purple or whatever you do. So we'll see you next time. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
Amen. If you could just bow your heads, I want to pray for you before we dismiss. Maybe you.